Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. It's been a while since we've done rank punditry around here. And um, um, although I've done it a little on this, I've done it a little on the solo side because when when in doubt and have nothing of substance to offer, I'll do punditry. Um, but when I want to do it right, when I do it, when I want to like actually uh, provide value, um, there's no one I go to more often or more reliably <laughs> <laughs> than our own, our own Chris Starwall. When, when I'm hungry, very often Taco Bell is the closest restaurant and that's why I go there. <laughs> welcome to, well, welcome back as the Arby's of punditry, uh, cause he has the meat. Ar- Arby's is delicious and, un- and underrated. Absolutely. Um, is it the police over there by you? Well, I live on Capitol Hill, and the uh, issue of crime in the District of Columbia didn't really take hold until every neighborhood where elites in Washington live was getting hit with random, violent, scary crime. And the uh, there's a recall effort on for one of the city councilmen, uh, and the amount of police presence I live near Eastern Market. The amount of police presence around here in the past six weeks has been e- extraordinary. Hmm. Yeah, so it's funny. I actually, we were just talking about this before we started. I gave a talk at the Sea Island thing, this World Forum thing that AI does. And I brought this up. I, I'm not going to do the whole thesis here, but I was providing examples of of elites not staying in their lane and doing things that people, doing things that 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 government can't do or trying to do things the government can't do while not doing the things the government is supposed to do. And one of the examples I used was, you know, in 2023, in this huge spike in crime in the in the District of Columbia, and 60, I think it was 67% of people arrested were not prosecuted. And then last month, there was this, the, the district attorney for the District of Columbia was at a very angry community meeting talking about crime, where the mostly African-American audience was very angry about crime. And this white liberal guy, something Shaul, I think his name is, says, look, at the end of the day, we cannot prosecute our way out of this problem. We have to surround people with resources. And for me, it's like, look, that's a venerable argument, root causes, Officer Krupke, all that kind of stuff. But like, it's like having the salesman in your company saying, hey, look, we have a lot of problems in this company, but we are not going to sell our way out of this problem, right? The guy in charge of prosecuting people should think prosecuting is a good idea. The guy in charge of sales should think sales is important. And this is like one of these things where like it it gets to, I mean, to bring it into punditry and stuff. If the Democratic Party could just understand, like, if you want to be the party of government, you got to do the government part really well if you want to be really ambitious. Well, think about think about the pendular swing on the issue of crime. So in five years ago, both Donald Trump and Joe Biden were distancing themselves from tough on crime policies, right? Uh, Donald Trump, who infamously took out an ad in the newspaper to declare uh, the guilt, uh, I think, did he call for their execution? it sounds right, um, of the Central Park Five Mm -hmm. and all of that stuff was reborn as a criminal justice reformer. And Kim Kardashian came to the White House and everybody, well, we need sentence reforming. When Joe Biden started his run, Kamala Harris, who had her own problems uh, with uh, progressive activists uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement for her time as a prosecutor and as attorney general, uh, went right after Biden on this stuff. And by the end of uh, 2020, Trump had, because of the riots, Trump had flipped um, and Biden had half flipped, right? He had, uh, he had switched, or not switched, he had taken a vehement stance uh, against defund the police. The truth is that the legislation that Joe Biden was pilloried for was Democrats' answer in the 1990s to extraordinary pressure uh, 
from Republican or, or spearheaded by Republicans, but that was from the ground up about the insane crime rates, especially murder rates in America's cities. And in Washington, uh, where we rightly lament the increase in violent crime and murder, there were 750 or so murders every year. And what people eventually said was, we got to do something. And incarceration is the only thing that we know that can stop this now. And so what the Clinton administration put together and Joe Biden helped lead in the Senate was Democrats compromise uh, on trying to do something to get tough on crime. So then we roll those things back. Everybody says, I don't know why we ever got we were sending so many people to prison in this mass incarceration. And then crime goes up and people say, we got to put more people in prison. And it is human nature and it's the way politics works and it's all of that. But it is unfortunate that as the pendulum swings, there's so much wreckage mm -hmm. as it moves from either direction. And instead of having consistent, normal, predictable policing and enforcement, we swing from lock them up to uh, what did what did this count? What did the, the D.C. guys surround people with resources, surround people with resources? Yeah, uh, it was surround uh, young people and their families with resources. Oh, I feel better already. I feel surrounded. So, you know, like, I mean, this is a long running theme. We've talked about various versions of this for a long time. I've written a ton about, you know, one of my favorite essays is Tom Wolfe's The Great Relearning. Oh. Um, and mm -hmm. the willingness to forget really obviously hard learned lessons is one of the constant threats to Western civilization. And I was talking about this recently in a different context about one of the best things, I mean, forget. The, the 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 legitimate economic suffering of people for a second and forget the political chaos that has come with it. One of the good things about our recent bout with inflation is that it's going to be another friggin' generation before yep. Democrats get to say inflation doesn't matter. Right? right. I mean, remember Rick Perlstein was saying a few years ago that he went and looked at uh, in his study of the 1970s politics, it turns out that Inflation really didn't bother people. It was really a metaphor for the oh, anti-feminist really? backlash, for the backlash against feminism and the dislocations of black civil rights and who cares about inflation. You had AOC with her trillion dollar coin kind of stuff. Now, like no friggin' Democrat or Republican with any sanity wants to be tagged with inflation. And that's a good thing, right? That's a that's a, that was a lesson I wish we didn't have to learn, but it was good that someone learned it. The uh, I, I'm a fanboy for Amity Schley's and her magnificent book, The Great Society, and basically she chronicles how the bipartisan consensus around dumping huge sums of money uh, into the economy to get to and I, look, it is human speaking of human nature. The Pentagon Papers tell us the same story. We just got to get to the next election, right? We just got to right. get through the next thing. If we can just get through this next thing, we promise we're going to straighten up and fly right as soon as we get to the other side. But this next election is so important that we just have to do the we have to do the wrong thing for a little while longer. And then once the the costs of doing the right thing go down, we'll do it. And sometimes people do it, right? Sometimes people do it, but usually they don't. Usually what they do and the, the bipartisan consensus that the, the, to me, the most uh, disappointing or frustrating uh, moment in inflation was not, in driving inflation, was not the orgy of spending that took place around coronavirus. Happy fourth anniversary, coronavirus lockdown enthusiasts. Oh, nice, yeah. uh, and let us never forget Josh Hawley's plan. I, I, I believe that we should never forget Josh Hawley's plan for dealing with the lockdowns, which was the federal government would borrow enough money to replace every dollar for every human being and every business in the country from the lockdowns. Um, <laughs> so le lest he ever, lest he ever say anything about inflation, let us remember what his plan was. I forgot um, that. But, but the, the most um, egregious moment was when the U.S. economy was humming, roaring at plus 4% GDP annualized. We still ran a trillion dollar deficit. We just said the both parties agreed. So Democrats, uh, embraced modern monetary policy and said, you know what, 
money's cheap, borrow all you can, do do whatever you want, invest in the future, it's fine. And at the beginning, Republicans said, wow, that's poppycock. You've got to live within your means. And they all put on their Calvin Coolidge starched collars and felt very good about it. But then when they had control, they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying you want me to limit economic growth by tamping down on spending or even just holding it level? Absolutely not. We can't do that because if we do, the bad people will win and then America will be lost forever. Because if we don't, if, if we don't hold the house in midterms, then life as we know it in the world is gone. So I feel a little bit like there's some listeners out there who are like Steve Martin in The Jerk when they're at the fancy restaurant and they get served snails. And Steve Martin is like, waiter, waiter, there are snails on these blades. Don't you know, look. Yes. Don't look. He says to, to Bernadette uh, Peters, that? yeah. Bernadette Peters, don't look. I'm getting the waiter. <laughs> and you think in a fancy restaurant like this, they could keep the snails off the plate. Now, bring me those toasted cheese sandwiches that you talked me out of in the first place. I promise people rank punditry. And here we're doing this yes. metaphysical thing about human nature. And My apologies. Learned. No, I started it. I apologize. Um, so here we are. Because I didn't wear my suspenders today. If I had suspenders on today, I could be snapping them and offering folksy aphorisms about politics. So we are. Oh, and I should congratulate you. You now have a new Sunday show. On I didn't even I didn't even do a proper introduction of you. You're a dispatch columnist. You are an AEI fellow, and um, and you are like the head political poobah on News Nation. And now you have a television show on Sundays. Um, people should add it to their repertoire. You you can watch The Hill Sunday with Chris Steyerwalt at 10 a.m. Eastern each and every Sunday. David Drucker, our colleague, has been on both of the first two shows. Drucker is the, a total stud. He is just so reliable and steady and good. Uh, and we've had other friends on. And look, I think it was very imprudent for this network to give me a show because I... I number one, don't know what I'm doing. And number two, if the premise of my media career is to tell people to be less thirsty and be uh, more, <laughs> more prudent uh, in their production and consumption of media, uh, I'm sort of in a corner, but um, it's so far been fun. And they've been extraordinarily generous with me about letting me do what I want. So We'll see. I think of it as sort of a Nixon to China kind of thing. That's right. <laughs> but uh, when the mud wrestling starts in two weeks, I'll say, <laughs> see, here's the thing. I have the credibility. Only I have the credibility to do mud wrestling. That's right. And so our next guest for a very important interview is Dewey Oxberger, and he's going to wrestle seven bikini clad women in a mud pit. Exactly. Um, all right. So we haven't talked since. I mean, we've talked, but not with an audience of dozens um, of uh, um, about uh, what's the word? Super Tuesday. Yeah. We haven't talked about how the Donald Trump is now semi officially, but in fact, for all intents and purposes, officially the Republican nominee. Um, the primaries are over. Um, ditto Joe Biden. There's an enormous amount of punditry that we're never going to get to use again because it's no longer relevant about the Michigan primary and the uncommitted and all these kinds of things. What is something that people should keep in mind from what has just transpired that will be of use in the future? Is the Nikki Haley faction a real faction? Are there Nikki Haley voters that uh, does that 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 faction of the GOP does it? Is it all going to come home? Is it going to vote for Biden? Does the Michigan uh, thing um, foretell of Biden's woes come the general election and the divides in the Democratic Party? What is the shape of the two coalitions? Chris Starwalt, I put it to you, sir. Donald Trump and Joe Biden um, were no more nor no less likely to be their party's nominees after Super Tuesday than they were after South Carolina, which is to say that once Donald Trump uh, beat Nikki Haley, not quite two to one in her home state, um, the idea that there would be a, a Republican contest going forward was far fetched to say the least. Right. Uh, and so it, it was effectively over 
for the Republicans there. And it was effectively over for Democrats when they went to South Carolina the week after. Um, when Dean Phillips finished third behind Marianne Williamson, who had suspended her campaign, I think we knew that the chance that Joe Biden would be caught uh, was nil. Um, now, as a weirdo, I like primary votes because anytime people vote, I get some insight into voter enthusiasm, uh, divisions within parties, where are people turning out, where are people not turning out. Um, the reason that it's still possible that Trump or Biden might not be their party's nominee is that we had every four years we say the same thing. Ooh, maybe there'll be an open convention. Maybe we will have a contested convention. And my job every four years is to tell people, no, there won't. It's mm -hmm. not going to happen. Um, barring somebody, you know, slipping on a banana peel and falling down an elevator shaft. No, that's not going to happen. This time, it's probably not going to happen. But what is it, a one in five chance that one, at least one of the two parties will have a different nominee uh, coming out of their convention? That would be exciting to cover because that's what I like to do. But it are you making that point? Are you saying it's a one in five chance because you're looking at the actuarial tables? Or I mean, what is the so actuarial tables? You have two elderly uh, presumptive nominees. You have one nominee who is facing a multitude of criminal charges. Um, and you have dissatisfaction among significant numbers in both parties. I think it is unlikely, but 20% ain't nothing, right? 20% mm -hmm. ain't nothing when you're talking about something like this. And the combination of those things just says, keep, you know, keep an eye open uh, for uh, what, what may transpire. So on the Democratic side, um, Donald Trump cures many ills. Donald Trump is the greatest balm to the Democratic Party um, that I am aware of because he does not, uh, attract almost, almost any Democrats. There are a handful of Democrats that are interested in Donald Trump or find him appealing, but we're talking 3% or something. Um, and for the rest of the Democratic Party, he's a massive coalition builder. And on the, on Super Tuesday, I was sitting on set, uh, and we're looking at the numbers come in. And, oh, look at Minnesota here for Joe Biden. Oh, look, at you go to Ilhan Omar's district. There's That's a big, uncommitted uh, vote. I don't know. This is the, you know, maybe this, they're certainly, they know it's a lost cause, but they really are still getting out to vote. Uh, and I even quoted you on air talking about the socialist barista crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I said, oh, that's very interesting. And then, as if cued, Donald Trump took to the stage and said, and when it comes to Israel, we tell him, finish the job, finish the job. And it's like, oh, sorry, hippies. Uh, mm -hmm. You you were going to uh, show Joe Biden what was what about Israel by threatening to withhold your vote in November. By the time Donald Trump is holding campaign events with Bibi Netanyahu, uh, you'll all be back, hippies. You'll, you'll all be back. Um, on the Republican side, something like 10 percent, 7 to 10 percent of Nikki Haley's support in open primaries came from Democrats who weren't going to vote for her in the general election had she won. Right. Mm -hmm. Those were not a, a very few of them would. Um, so that was some of her support, some of her support, probably slightly more, but a similar size of her support came from people who will vote for Donald Trump. They are Republicans who would have preferred uh, Ralph Norman, her um, uh, her former congressman. Uh, well, I guess he's still her congressman. Uh, but uh, Ralph Norman, the only South elected Carolina. Republican in the state to support Nikki. Yeah. Right. Um, I think is indicative of that chunk of Haley supporters. And by the way, John Thune and Mitch McConnell and a, a, a whole host of people who would have preferred in, in elected office who would have preferred Nikki Haley uh, will either vote for Donald Trump or say that they voted for Donald Trump and write in Charles Krauthammer. Mm -hmm. And that's so. So then there's that part. The part that's interesting is the part that is, let's say, the other half, uh, the other half of Nikki Haley's third of the Republican Party. So, you know, that's 15 percent of the Republican Party, 15 or more percent of the Republican Party, they don't want to vote for Donald Trump. 
and most of them won't. Um, and Joe Biden's job basically between now and November is to convince those people that they can't, that they mustn't, right? That, yep, uh, you don't like these policies. You don't like my stuff. You don't care for me. I'm too old. I totally understand. But we mustn't return Donald Trump to power. It's simply too dangerous to return Donald Trump to power, even if I am a, a poor answer. And I think you've seen in the flurry of coverage of January 6th, uh, we're recording this on Tuesday, and there's been all of this coverage around January 6th and around the Trump documents pay case and all of this stuff. And Democrats will be putting that up the nose of that 15 percent of the Republican Party uh, for the next 238 days and saying, you good with this? You feel you feel good about about this guy? You, you're ready to do it. And that's where that the reason I think Joe Biden is slightly more likely to win reelection than to lose it is that his coalition, which has many problems, it's got low enthusiasm among uh, hippies, it's got um, a declining alopecia. support, it's got alopecia, uh, it's got plaque psoriasis. No, it's got, um, it's got problems with uh, non-white men, particularly. There, there are many maladies that the Democratic coalition has. But in what I expect to be a base versus base election, the Democratic base seems to me more enthusiastic about negative partisanship mm -hmm. than Republicans. So, I mean, you kind of answered it, but just let me, let me rephrase the question a little bit. I spent a lot of time on CNN panels during the primaries. And one of the points that I'd make in one way, other people would make in another way, is, look, Republican primary voters are almost by, it's almost axiomatic, are more enthusiastic voters than normal voters, right? Because right. they're showing up, particularly in right. cold weather, to do this, right? And so the lack of enthusiasm from Republican primary voters for Donald Trump would be suggestive that for normal voters, that lack of enthusiasm was more acute, right? Because, um, like, if if even people who turn out on a Tuesday night in February, if 40% of them say they're not MAGA, or 20% of them say they will be unhappy with Donald Trump as the nominee, what do, like, the normals feel? And the counter argument to that is, yeah, but the normals aren't paying attention and they're much more comfortable with Donald Trump and they don't really think about this. How should we think about what what is the right way to interpret the turnout of people who do show up and how different is it from the voters who are going to decide? Things? Primary turnout was pretty high um, mm -hmm. this year. Iowa with the blizzard um, was low. But in New Hampshire and South Carolina, we saw a big, big turnout. Uh, and a lot of people were excited to vote for Donald Trump. And a lot of people were excited to vote against Donald Trump. He is this extraordinary jet fuel uh, in turnout. Now, the 2022, so what we saw in 2018 and 2020 was astonishing. We saw historically high turnout. We saw the highest turnout in a modern quadrennial presidential election. And when I say modern, I mean post uh, Voting Rights Act, uh, post full female participation in the workforce, all the way live. And we had the highest turnout election ever. Um, and 2018 saw turnout for a midterm that was as high as presidential elections were when times were good in the country, right? So in the late 80s and 90s, uh, we were getting 50% turnout and we got 50% turnout for a uh, biennial midterm. These are, of course, troubling for a country. Um, high turnout is uh, a hallmark of troubled times. People don't turn out in large numbers because they're just so happy uh, about things. And these are the normal voters that you're talking about, right? These are the, yeah, I'll vote if I remember yeah, I'll vote if, you know, oh, you know, actually, I had to pick my mom up uh, at the at the nursing home that day because it was we were getting ready for Timmy's birthday and I didn't get to it. And they're not they're, they're not bothered by it. They may say, oh, I, I meant to vote, but they didn't do it. 
um, those people didn't forget and didn't overlook and they sent in their ballots and they they registered because they were anxious. Donald Trump's if Joe Biden's job is to terrify America about what Trump, uh, the Trump restoration would look like. Donald Trump's job is to try to be normal, right? His job is to try to act as normal as possible. And on the negative side of that for him is that he is himself. And because he did not, because he did not face a serious challenge in the primaries, he, I'm sure, believes that he is, you know, Prometheus unbound. He can do anything uh, and he will be unchecked and very hard to manage. Donald Trump is at his best politically when he's scared. And based on what he experienced in the primaries and based on what um, polling has shown, I doubt Donald Trump is is scared about what may happen. We remember that in 2016, the way Donald Trump won was that he crashed so hard uh, after the Access Hollywood tape that he became willing to act normal for a little while. Even um, apologized, and, which is like the even one apo- time, right? even apologized. The Gettysburg redress of grievances starts out looking out and saying they're too ugly. To, these women are too ugly to sexually harass. And then he <laughs> looks at the prompter and says the words that Kellyanne Conway or whomever wrote for him and becomes a more normal candidate and becomes acceptable enough. So on the negative side, he is unafraid. And as his uh, truth social posts and his comments at speeches and all of this stuff indicate, uh, we're, we're in for Mr. Toad's wild ride yet again. On the other hand, he has a real campaign. Um, I saw a lot of uh, belly aching uh, about the purge that uh, is taking place at the Republican National Committee. They cashiered a bunch of people and, uh, oh, his uh, daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, uh, has been installed as co-chair and, you know, oh, they're, they're going to drive it into the dirt. If that's what Democrats think is going on, they are mistaken. What's going on is that Chris LaCivita, who I have watched whip campaigns into shape, right? Chris LaCivita, he's, he may be crazy in the lowercase C way, right? He may be a wild man, but he's very good at this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember distinctly when he went in and uh, I apologize to the senator, I can't remember his name, uh, but was about to lose reelection in Kansas Mm -hmm. and they had totally failed. And the Republican National Senatorial Committee sent Chris LaCivita out to Kansas and he whipped them into shape. He fixed the, a chaotic, failed, sclerotic campaign. So when you add in you, the media message guy is John Braybender, a veteran of Bush World, a veteran of, you know, a guy who has done the ads for half of the Republican senators most anxious about Donald Trump. So the clean, cleaning house at the RNC and getting rid the Ronda Romney McDaniel contingent there and putting in people that Chris LaCivita and Laura Trump, who is a very ambitious person, right? She was toying with the Senate run in North Carolina. Democrats should be concerned about this uh, because if they have an RNC that works, and of course with Trump, because it's a family member, he's more likely to not in a fit of peak, fire everyone. This isn't like yelling at Corey Lewandowski in the back of the plane, right? Mm-hmm. This this is this is different. And as this moves forward, they'll bring in the big money donors. They'll bring in um, more and more people will say, more and more establishment Republicans will say, yeah, well, look, we're going to Trump, we, we can do it again. We, we found a way to shoot the rapids last time. We can do it again. Let's just give it our best shot. So I, uh, just wrote my LA Times column. It was funny. I wrote my LA Times column where I was using what was going on at the RNC as an example for it. And then the actual story broke late in the day um, where they actually were doing the purges because I was just talking about the intended stuff. So it was, it was I stumbled onto Newsy, a good news bag. Um, the thing I did exactly I lo- the same thing. I did exactly the same thing for my dispatch column that is out this yeah. morning, which is I wrote it about Laura Trump. And then I woke up today and it was like, oh, timely. OK, good. It's um, it happens sometimes. Um, it's not like my um, cover story for National Review on the beauty of offshore oil drilling, uh, like 
six weeks before the BP oil uh, disaster. That was that was different. Um, or my <laughs> my cover story on Bomb Canada for the beginning of the U.S. Canadian Friendship Society ad campaign in National Review that no one told me was coming. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, sometimes timing is not our friend. But so the way I put it in the column, which by the time this airs will be available on the dispatch site, is that there's good news and bad news for Trump insofar as, um, and it's all the same news. And it's that he can no longer claim that he's running against the Republican establishment, right? In any way, shape, or form. He is the Republican establishment now, right? He's the de facto nominee. He's put loyalists and family members at the head of the RNC. He has chased out virtually everybody, right? Mitch McConnell's not going to run as a uh, leader in the House again, I mean, in the Senate again. Um, and uh, Heritage has gone full Trumpy. CPAC is really TPAC now. Uh, Mike Gallagher is leaving. All, you know, McHenry's leaving. I mean, you just go down this list. There are very few people who are going to say anything particularly dissenting. Nikki Haley's out, right? And that is a difficult place for them to be in a certain way because part of the whole kayfabe of this was always that they were taking on the Republican establishment and now they are the Republican establishment. Um, but there's also a silver lining, it seems to me, if he loses for, as, as a conservative, who cares more about the conservative movement than I'd care about the Republican Party, is that they've made it very clear they don't want a bigger tent. They don't think they need a bigger tent. We don't need your help. They're still peeing from a great height on Ron DeSantis's head. Uh, Donald Trump in rallies is saying uh, the party is 96 to 100 percent MAGA now. We're getting rid of the Romneys. We don't need these people. And the reckoning that should have happened in 2020, but didn't because Trump lied about the election being stolen. I don't know if you knew that he lied, but I just wanted to tell you that. Um, Wait, what? <laughs> um, this checks out. Um, I mean, look, I got, I'm going to I'm going to pull up the tables from Arizona and, and, <laughs> and recalculate if the Trumpies lose in 2024, the reckoning that the party needs to do to say, look, you had your shot, which, which is what they should have said in 2020, will be unavoidable at that point. Yeah, they'll still try to blame. You know, the non MAGA people for sabotaging them and all the rest, but um, this is how parties heal is by actually giving factions a shot, and then if they blow it, say, and holding them accountable. The, doubt, the, up, the flip side is if he wins, then the GOP, I do, I do think, basically becomes a nationalist MAGA party for the foreseeable future. What do you think of all that? So um, uh, in the Financial Times, uh, a data analyst named John Byrne Murdoch has a piece out that is getting much notice yeah. about what's happening with non-white voters and Democrats and their shifting allegiances. Now, I will say as a, a one point of criticism that he is imprudently lumping together Hispanic voters and black voters. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Um, th that's not that's not right. Uh, the difference is you can see in the 2020 election how very different Hispanic voters in Florida are from Texas, from Arizona, from Nevada to California. It's just not it's just not that way. If your last name is Garcia, it doesn't it's not the same as being black. Right. And right. we've talked before about shifting definitions of whiteness uh, and uh, how the if you'll pardon me, the construct of race uh, changes uh, generation to generation. Um, so th that having been said, he makes a good point about we can, the, there are two things that are happening, which is that the descendants of immigrants from the turn of this century and uh, the second half of the 20th century are trending Republican, which is what happened a hundred years ago with the immigrants that came to the United States from Southern and Eastern Europe and their descendants, right? Italians, Poles, Czechs, Croats, Latvians, Lithuanians, you name it, Greeks, a lot of Jewish Americans. And with the exception of Jews, who stayed mostly Democratic for 100 plus years, um, 
the salience of their ethnicity uh, declined over time, which is logical because it became less important to them in their lives and therefore their political attachment to it would also understandably be less. Um, but it is a huge opportunity for Republicans to continue to rack up points with basically middle class um, non-white voters. Now, what this leaves out is something on the other side, which is what happens to the people who the working class voters squeeze out of the Republican Party? Because looked at one way, um, if, you, if, if Trump is, the, is your explanation for everything, if one, if one explains everything by Donald Trump, which is, by the way, what a lot of Republicans do. They're like, okay, well, it's just the Trump thing. And then one day he'll be dead and he'll be gone and it, we'll go back. You won't go back. Um, you certainly won't go back after nominating him thrice. It's, right. it's certainly it certainly will not happen, um, but it will it will not happen because of other demographic pressures uh, that are taking place. The Republican Party. So you talk about a reckoning that happens after a Trump loss. But what if on the other side of the reckoning or what if the reckoning on the other side is a further purge? Right. What if on the other side it is concluded that the real problem was these well, what if it's concluded the real problem is you? What if the real problem are classical liberals? What if the real problem are libertarian-leaning conservatives? What if the real problem is actually, I had a conversation with a congressman one time who said that what Republicans had to do was make it, as he said it, impossible for college-educated voters to vote for Republicans. And I said, well, that seems kind of crazy because, <laughs> because by 20, I don't know, 2030, the majority of voters will be. So now it's a majority of younger voters, but older voters, it's 35 percent. So we we fall at something like 45 percent of the electorate is college educated. That will be 55 percent and it will be 60 percent. Um, and the the question for Democrats is basically this. Can they find a home for these people? Can they make, can Democrats hold in tension the socialist barista community, Black Lives Matter, um, the Green uh, Revolution, and the Eisenhower kind of suburban people who, when it was uh, from uh, Dick Nixon to uh, George W. Bush, they, they, their children and grandchildren were perfectly fine to, you, you know a lot of these people uh, in your life and they say, well, you know, I'm, what do they say? I'm fiscally conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, socially, I'm, I'm, I'm liberal because that's, that's where they are. So if the Democrats can make a home, a place, if, if the blue dog world of the Democratic Party can become rejuvenated and Biden or his, more accurately, his successors can say to AOC, I'd love to give you what you want, but look at all these people over here in our party, right? And they're making demands of me as well. So that's the, the, the question for Republicans is for this election, can they act normal enough to not frighten all of those people away? And on the Democratic side, can they act normal enough to be a safe landing space for them? We've talked about this before. You wrote about it recently. Um, I think Dennis from 30 Rock was the John the Baptist of Trumpism because he was the character yes. who, when, when Jack Donaghy, who was like the country club Republican character, asked him what his politics were. Dennis says, uh, fiscally liberal, socially conservative. Yes. And, um, and increasingly, that's sort of where, that's what Donald Trump is. The, this character from 30 Rock, for those who don't know, was a sort of a perfect avatar of a kind of New Yorker that, um, you know, one of my favorite lines from him was when uh, he's explaining to Liz Lemon why his friend needs to stay at her apartment for a while with them. And he begins by telling the story about how he was jumped by some black guys. And it's only through the telling of the story five minutes later that he reveals the black guys were cops they were police officers <laughs> yes exactly and, um and anyway there's this there's this the 
the one of the weirder things in American life is how the left has kind of completely abandoned any talk of class being a very important prism for understanding life because the intersectionality stuff is all about identity politics. Mm -hmm. And so um, class stuff has now migrated rightward as if you want to complain about class now, you, you're a right winger. Whereas in the past, it was always a left wing thing to, to complain about class. And the right was, you know, old style right wing racism is identity politics, right? Yes. Um, and so it's, just, it's weird how these things, these sort of mind viruses migrate around. That being said, because it's absolutely extraneous and random observation that really doesn't have a lot to do with this, or at least I forgot why I brought it up in the first well, place. Well, it's the the you'll be back dummies. You'll be back dummies, <laughs> said Dennis Duffy. And that's what I, uh, you know, of the many great gifts, uh, in, immeasurable gifts that my Jessica has given me. Uh, opening up 30 Rock to me, which I, I think I missed uh, yeah. when it came out. The first three seasons, two seasons are just fantastic. Yeah. And then they come back at the very end. The, the end last season or two is really good. Um, yeah. And it's a, just a fabulous show. But the um, I, I entitled that column, uh, You'll Be Back Dummies, because the, Trump, it just has that sort of um, the uh, the we could try to do better. But you know what? it kind of feels good to just stay right here. And inertia is extraordinarily powerful. Um, on the question of race versus class, back to crime. Mm -hmm. If you look at um, law enforcement as principally a question that relates to racial identity, you uh, miss what law enforcement is actually for, which is keeping the peace. And as, and people mostly Democrats, but some Republicans did, they started thinking about it primarily as a question of race and racial identity and not the fact that who suffers most when crime is high? Not me. It's right. not me. Um, I can, I can, I could live someplace else. I could move. Um, but uh, the people who suffer the most are, are stuck in bad neighborhoods where crime is highest and uh, regardless of their race or ethnicity. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been banging my spoon in my head here about this for a very long time. Crime is a regressive tax on poor people. Totally. You know, there was this absolutely ridiculous piece in the Washington Post about 10 days ago oh. about the CVS in Columbia Heights, which... An um, allegory of late stage capitalism. Yeah, and you know, like there was, you know, it was such a virtue signaling to the crazy left kind of piece, you know, where America is a sticky fingered country on stolen land and yada, yada, yada. And how dare you sort of suggest that crime has anything to do with a drugstore closing because of shoplifting. And it was just so ridiculous. But the simple fact is like, like we used to have a, a part time nanny person for my my daughter and she wasn't in great shape she was an older lady and she lived in a in not fantastic part of town and I would drive her home often because otherwise it was like an hour and a half of buses and stuff and um when her closest drugstore closed she mm -hmm. was just screwed right I mean she yep. couldn't she had a walker she couldn't you know and the people who are cavalier about like these places closing down um they have they they drive to Trader Joe's and Whole Foods and Wegmans and the people who have to walk to the closest drugstore when you take the closest drugstore out of the way and the next one is a mile and a half away. That is a profound tax on their life. And um, the 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 elite disdain for those concerns is just infuriating to me. The um, there's a similar story to be told on the Mexico U.S. Mexico border, which is. Um, Tom Swazi, who represents George Santos's former district um, uh, now, who won in a special election, ran a very hardline campaign on immigration. Mm -hmm. Very hardline. Um, if you didn't know that he was the Democrat and looked at the ads, you would have said, oh, this is the Republican candidate in this district. And for Democrats who, look, we could tell the same story with Republicans and Obamacare, which is you got to get us in there. We're going to get rid of this thing. 
And then they get in and they're like, oh, this is much harder than we thought. And we don't really know how to deal with this. We don't we're not willing to take the political risks necessary to deal with it and therefore failed. Democrats believed while Donald Trump was president. Oh, it's simple, right? Stop putting kids in cages. It's uh, this is barbaric. And so Joe Biden delivered on his his main promise to the left was to roll back Trump's border policies, which he did. And through a combination of the incentives that that created uh, and just the simple fact that one of the defining features of the world that we live in now are poor people in a chaotic and impoverished southern hemisphere trying to enter the wealthy and stable Northern Hemisphere. That's a story in Europe. That's a story in Asia. That's a story here. And um, a combination of those things has turned into Joe Biden's biggest, his biggest liability is that he is uh, approximately 1 billion years old. Uh, His second greatest liability is the fact that when you look at numbers among Democrats on their anxiety about the border and immigration, up, 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 up. And whether or not Biden can get reelected will depend on how much leeway will depend in part on how much leeway his own party will give him to address an issue that working class Democratic leaning voters are very concerned about. If you live in Philadelphia, which is there's no place in America more important to Democrats hopes of holding on to the White House than Philadelphia. This is this is absolutely the epicenter. It's the state Biden must win. It's the biggest city in the state that Biden must win. If you experience day in and day out problems related to unhoused migrants passing through your community, stressing resources, committing crimes. Yes, I know non-migrants commit crimes at a higher rate. Da, 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 I, I got it. I understand. But if what you're experiencing on a day to day basis is chaos in your community because of these migrant populations that are drifting through the United States, that's a big problem. As much as people want to talk, Democrats want to talk about democracy, which I think is overrated. But (laughs) anyway, um, the as much as they want to talk about democracy and all of those things that are great motivators for those Nikki Haley kind of voters. It's great. It's great to talk about that stuff. You're not going to be able to count on the kind of support you need among working class, particularly urban voters, if you have not substantially addressed the flow of migrants across the border. And that's just the fact. Yeah, it's it's funny. I got into this snippy fight with Van Jones on CNN on one of the election nights, and it's come up a few other times to the point where I I, I think that it it's a sincerely held but factually wrong position. There are an enormous number of of Democrats, particularly pretty progressive Democrats, who have convinced themselves that New York, L.A., Washington, D.C., Chicago, they have these problems with migrants because Mm -hmm. Texas sent them there. And it's absolutely true that Abbott sent... Text, you know, text, Abbott wants to say 100,000 people were sent. The, the number is probably closer to 50,000 or 60,000 or something like that. Yeah. The number of people of migrants who've crossed the border illegally, I don't know, it was three, five million. I mean, it's a very large number. Right. A lot of them were staying on the border as a publicity stunt. What they did was brilliant. You know, I didn't necessarily appreciate it for its brilliance at the time. I don't like using humans as props. But um, the idea that but for Greg Abbott. Right. And maybe Doug Ducey sending, uh, call it 100,000 migrants, that these cities wouldn't be having these problems is nonsense. It is just, right. and like the New York Times has reported as much. Like like these these migrants, they do cluster down there. But for those who have any social networks whatsoever, they move to where there are jobs further away, um, or they try to. And um, the denial that comes from this that says this isn't an actual problem, right? It's a Republican spread problem. It's particularly problematic because the very assumptions inherent to sort of progressivism should say that this is a national problem and not a problem of just border states. 
And they should be eager, particularly people who champion sanctuary cities, should be eager to take these people. But all of a sudden, because it's a political problem, they want to make it the story of, of perf- you know, the perfidy of Republicans. How, how much time has Joe Biden spent on the use of the word illegal? Too much? Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the fact that, uh, I forget which Castro brother, um, Julian or Joaquin, not, uh, not Fidel uh, or, the or Raul. Yeah. Um, the, 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 whichever Castro brother that just pilloried, I guess it was probably Julian, um, just pillorying Biden for you can't say that. No person is illegal, just outrage and all of that stuff. And Biden having to go back and he did an interview with uh, Jonathan Capehart from mm-hmm. the Washington Post and like, oh boy. I am so, so sorry. I am so, so sorry. And I thought that would have been a super cool opportunity for Joe Biden to say, yeah, you know, I know that's not the preferred term of art and I I am sorry, but I get so mad when I see this happen. I get so mad when I see these people who who are coming to this country to, uh, because of the opportunity that we present, abuse the system and commit crimes and a heinous crime like this one, I get so mad that I forget myself. And that would have been a great moment. That would have mm-hmm. been a great moment for him because what Biden will need between now and the election are multiple occasions in which he says to the Democratic Party, Soto Voce, you better let me do this or you're going to get Trump. You better let me mm-hmm. do this and appeal to just if all you have to do is you think about this election, just keep thinking about Pennsylvania. Just think about how does how does Joe Biden win Pennsylvania? Because if he wins Pennsylvania, he's also going to have won Michigan and Wisconsin. Probably uh, Wisconsin is a little dicey, mm-hmm. um, but he will certainly have won Michigan. I think it's going to be hard for Biden to win Arizona and Georgia again. Uh, or right now, it looks like it will be hard for him to do those things in part because of these issues, in substantial part because of these issues. But Pennsylvania is the microcosm. And what Democrats have to do is give Joe Biden room to win Pennsylvania. And if you listen to uh, Governor Shapiro, and if you listen to Senator Fetterman, you hear how you win Pennsylvania. You hear what Pennsylvania wants. And what Pennsylvania wants is tough on crime, serious about immigration, and pro-Israel. Mm-hmm. That's that's the winning that's the winning combination to win Pennsylvania. And if if the Julian Castro's of the world um, who represent a noisy and significant minority of the of the Democratic Party, if they can't let Biden breathe a little bit here and appeal to the Fettermanian community, um, then he can't win. Yeah, I mean, I was just uh, as you know, you kind of s- my fault for going long. I recorded a podcast earlier this morning with Dan Senor, um, which may come out after this. So the whole space time continuum is kind of a Mobius strip for me right now. I opened up, I opened up the, the portal while you were still doing it. And I just found it very odd that you guys were both wearing all leather. I just thought it was a weird, I thought it was a weird choice. That's all I'm going to say. Um, well, as you know, the phrase, assless chaps is redundant because <laughs> chaps don't have backsides. But anyway, that's a, that's a different thing. Um, let's, let's not play semantic games here. <laughs> um, and I was talking to him about how, like, and we've talked about this, and actually I, I, a lot of my thinking is shaped by a conversation I had with you about this. One of my great frustrations with the Israel talk, and I don't know if this shocks you, but I had Dan Cena to talk about Israel, um, is that because the Michigan stuff, because, because the the pro-Palestinian or pro-Hamas, which I do think are, those are different things. Yeah, yeah, But yeah. it is shocking how much overlap there is between the two. <laughs> um, the Venn diagram, these are not separate circles, but that's a different conversation. Um, because the pro-Palestinian protests are, or the anti-Israel protests are designed to get attention, right? They're designed to command the attention of the Democratic Party, of Joe Biden, of the media. They get the attention of the Democratic Party, Joe Biden, and the media. But the the unstated assumption implicit in all this is that if Biden had handled Israel the way Rashida Tlaib wants, he would be in a better political place. And that is a hot garbage position. And 
It doesn't mean there wouldn't be costs. There, there wouldn't be, you wouldn't pick up voters if you did that, but you would lose more voters, I would argue, because Correct. this country is more pro-Israel than it is anti-Israel. And Jews are high propensity voters in certain places like the Philly suburbs that he needs. And because they're not out there protesting their support or something of Joe Biden, people seem to think that they would stick with Biden if Biden reversed course. And they, in all likelihood, would not. And all you have to do is look at what John Fetterman and Shapiro are doing to say there's actually more headroom for Biden going the other way than there is, like, there's no pleasing the right cease, pro ceasefire crowd, right? Um, I guarantee you if, if there's a cease, if, if he agreed to a cease, if he put pressure on, you know, somehow got Israel to do a ceasefire, it's not like that all of a sudden those guys would become quiet or stop or would stop demanding anything. And I just think Biden doesn't, uh, Biden listens to the people who yell at him. He listens to the people who are making noise in his bubble and the people who like what he's doing aren't making noise. And and so he, I think that explains his waywardness in the State of the Union on the Israel stuff because some of that I thought was indefensible. So he's he's caught in between two things. And as uh, as I point out to people, there are more Jewish American voters in the state of New York than there are Arab American voters in the entire nation. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, And Pennsylvania is one of just a few states where the Jewish vote is huge, right? Absolutely huge. So Biden is getting it from the left for being too supportive of Israel and then taking it right in the chops on the other side for mealy-mouthing his support for Israel, right? Right. Um, where were the mentions of the increase in anti-Semitism in the State of the Union? Where was that? Where was that? So he is he's really stuck and nothing will address this. Uh, my assumption is that Joe Biden says one thing publicly on Israel and then privately says something else. Right. Mm -hmm. That privately he says to Netanyahu, hurry up, finish up. I'm trying to play for time here, but I'm running out of time. Right. And uh, that and if if this is still an issue going into the Democratic convention, it's a serious problem for him, not just because of what might happen at the convention. But by then it's too late. Right. It can't fade as an issue if it's, but if he can if, if somehow this can if if what do they say kinetic operations are concluded by, say, the 4th of July, then there's time for this to to ease. Uh, but. Uh, right now he is, he, Biden is really, really stuck. I wish we could go longer, but I actually have to go give a talk to a bunch of young people about, I, I'm not making this up, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. So, um, this is a, this is a, a powerful nerd moment. You are truly, you are like you, a formative moment for a new generation of nerds. Congratulations. Yeah, it's a fun for American studies luncheon thing. And, um, um. And uh, I'm ill prepared, but I will. I the, will those are the best that. speeches. Grip yeah. it and rip it, baby. Get in there and grip it and rip it. So, with that, uh, Chris Darwalt, always a pleasure. Uh, the Hill on News Nation Sunday is what time? 10 a.m. Eastern. Join us. And uh, always great to have you. And obviously, we will have you back. Thank you, my friend. Okay. So, Brother Starwalt has left, left the studio. And. Um, Always good to catch up with him. There was a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to get to to talk about, but I just didn't get a chance and I have to get out of here. Um, uh, I have many things to talk about for the for the ruminant later this week. Um, um, so I'll save all my pithy comments for that. And uh, thanks for listening. It was really great this weekend. It was all off the record and all that, but running into so many fans of the dispatch and subscribers of the dispatch, it's really, it's, 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 and listeners of this podcast, um, uh, which is a little disturbing sometimes to realize how many people listen to this podcast that I think are impressive people. Um, but uh, there you have it. And um, anyway, if you are not a subscriber to the Dispatch, I think you're really missing out. I think it is worth the money. I think it is worth um, the money on just pure quality alone. But I also think it's worth it because what we're trying to do is really important. And um, oh, you should go check out. Uh, I, I think the AMA is out. If not, it will be soon. That's in the skiff. If you're a subscriber, you can see that. Uh, you can listen to that. And that's where uh, 
guy asked me all sorts of stuff about weird things. And the Dune Nerdathon um, is behind the paywall at the Skiff as well, where David French, Adam, and I talk at great length about the Dune movie and other nerdy things. And other than that, I'll see you next time. No, 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 you won't. Uh, this is a podcast. <laughs>